genuinely my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Hey, would you put your hands together for all our first-time guests? We are so glad that you're here. Thank you to everybody who's joining us online as well. Um, you know, for some reason during the worship, God was taking me down memory lane, and it was kind of interesting some of the things that he was having, you know, kind of show up in my mind. And um, there were these defining moments and distinct moments in my Christianity that began to shape me. And one of them surrounds part of the message that we're going to share today. But um, even before that, how many of you were only children as you were a kid? Did anybody grow up and you were the only child in your household, right? So we tended to be kind of selfish maybe, the world revolved around us, and that was the kind of spirit that I maybe had when I was growing up. And the second I became a believer, things began to change very rapidly. Um, I remember almost instantly we began to tithe right when we got saved. So this spirit of generosity flipped in my head, this, this concept of giving immediately transformed. Uh, it wasn't there before. I, I was selfish in nature. Life was about me, what my wants, my needs, my desires were all about. And all of a sudden, I start tithing, like right out of the jump. And I'm like, what in the heck is this, you know? And uh, I remember some early on moments where um, you would have never caught Mary Jo and I dead on a Sunday afternoon going to feed the homeless. That just was not going to be part of our life and our walk and who we were. But all of a sudden, we felt compelled to participate, and we gave up much of each of our Sunday afternoons for years to go out and help the Samaritan ministry that our church had had. Um, I remember very distinctly early on um, as a kid. I, we got saved when we were 22. I couldn't have been but 23 years old maybe at the time. And the church put forward this need for a television with a built-in VCR for the kids' church. I mean, can you imagine a television with a... a how many of you had a television with a built-in VCR? Come on, Jesus, right? It, it, it was like $300. I think I was... It, 500, I think I made $400 a week at that time, way, way back then, maybe if that, right? And uh, we gave up that whole entire week's salary and maybe more um, to go buy this TV for the kids' church. And as I got a little bit later on in my Christianity, we started a tradition here at Journey Church where we gave out Thanksgiving baskets. And I'm here to tell you they're more than just Thanksgiving baskets. There's something sacred in the midst of them. I can't tell you how many people over the years, I always try to make sure we deliver a couple of them just as a reminder in these moments that end up sticking in your head. Like for me, that television early on, or the first time that we went out there to Samaritan ministry, or, or even the first baskets that we delivered, or even taking them to a great friend who remains a great friend in my life even today, where his family found themselves in need and was not going to have a Thanksgiving or a Christmas. And yes, those families may be blessed in the so doing, but it did something in my heart. It did something in Mary Jo's heart. It began to transform us and change us from the people that we used to be into the people that we're continuing to try to be in our own day and age and in our own generation. So I put these baskets out here before you today, and I'm ready to pause right here at the beginning of the service and ask you to get up out of your seats if you feel so led and grab one or more of those baskets and take them with you. Um, go give them out and use those to make a difference and watch what God does not only in the hearts of the person that ends up being the recipient of it, but maybe what God does in your heart as well. As you're grabbing those, I'm going to pray, Father, we thank you and praise you. As we dive into your word today, would you use it as a defining moment in our lives today? Would this be a day that for each and every one of us, something would come out of it that we would remember for the rest of our lives here on earth and maybe even into eternity? For each one of us, maybe that moment would be a very different one, Lord God, but would you touch somebody's heart and change them today? For those who are here who might not be followers of you, Lord, would you use this as a moment to touch their heart and transform it that they may become followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for taking those. You know, we're in the book of Revelation. We spent an entire year on this series, War in the Heavens. If you missed it, I encourage you to go back and watch some of those messages and a lot of them have surrounded this very real war that's going on in heavenly places that has ramifications here on earth. And when you look at the book of Revelation, it's easy to look at all the salacious things that are in there. 
You look at all the tragedy and all the danger and all the challenge of these events that are to come in the future, and that could become your focus of this book. But I'm here to tell you that's not really the focus of the book of Revelation. The focus of the book of Revelation is none other than Jesus Christ. You see, when you open up the book of Genesis, it says, We created the heavens and the earth, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and this host of heavenly beings that was already there in the heavens were all present at the creation of earth. It didn't take too long for this snake to slither out there into the garden and start to mess some things up. The first salvo of the battle that was going on in the heavenly places began to manifest itself here on earth. And we've been suffering the pain of the sin for all of these times since that first day until now. And then what we're going to end up getting here in a moment is a glimpse of what the future holds for the people who are here on earth. It's an exciting book, but we must remind ourselves that the focus of this book is none other than Jesus Christ. And as we open up this book, I really have a couple of hopes. They're ones that I often have, but I'd like to repeat them to you here today. We're reading this book not because we're trying to instill fear. Can I get an amen, right? That is not why we're reading this book. We're reading it with the hope and expectation of Christ's soon return. We're reading it with the hope that in so doing, some people who are not now followers of Jesus will become followers of Jesus. We're preaching this book with the hope that it creates a sense of urgency in your heart and in mind that we would live for Jesus all the more and that we would all the more fervently share the good news of the gospel with others knowing what is to come. Let me tell you, it is to come, right? It's going to happen. The things that we're reading in this book were prophesied by Daniel and others long before we ever came onto earth. And I assure you that it will come to pass. Right now, we're living in what is called the church age. It's an age defined by grace. And what you're about to witness is a change of seasons. A change and an ending of this church age that Pastor Adam was talking about with these different churches that he talked about last week, right? And entering into a season of judgment. And you might say, how could God judge? I assure you, even in his judgment, his greatest hope is that through this judgment, through the discipline that is coming onto the earth, that people would repent of their sins and would be saved. He's not doing it because he's some cosmic God that's angry with us. He's doing it because he's a just and righteous God. And guess what? Our sins need to be judged and our sins need to be covered by none other than the blood of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again on the third day. Do you believe that he exists? Do you believe that he's alive? Do you believe that he's in heaven right now, seated at the right hand of God the Father? So what John is experiencing here is a distinct shift in the verses that we're about to read in chapter 4. He's going from what was the church age to what is and what is to come. He's going to give us a glimpse into the throne room of heaven. He's going to give us a glimpse into this war that we've been talking about, right? We've been talking about the fact that there's this war that's going on in heaven and there's ramifications of it here on earth. And here you're really going to see it lived out. You're going to see what's happening in the throne room of God and then what ends up occurring on earth as a result. And as you think about that happening in the future sense, think about the events that we're encountering right here, right now on earth today. There is a real war. The devil is alive. He's trying to take you out. But guess what? As believers, you can be victorious in Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you today, I encourage you to go to chapter 4. We're going to read a lot from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 7 today. But Revelation 4 opens up in verse 1. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. What does the word this mean here? He's giving us some context. When the church age ends, then guess what? This is what is going to occur next. After the conclusion, what was is history, what is now is the church age, and what is to come is going to happen in the future. So immediately, John gets thrust into the throne room of heaven. He's seeing what's going on in there. 
And as I said a little bit earlier, we're going to see the ramifications here on earth. What does John see? First and foremost, we should be assured of this even now. The first thing that he sees is God seated on the throne. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I don't want you to take these next words for granted. Man, think about the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's there on the throne right now, this very moment. He's in control of everything. Even when things seem chaotic out there, guess what? God is still in control. God is in control. He also sees this amazing host of heavenly beings, angels, and other amazing creatures that I shared about not too long ago in a message on angels. There's also 24 thrones of elders who are casting their crowns at the feet of the king. You know, the Bible tells us for those of us who are believers, guess what? There are crowns that you will be given and that there are rewards in heaven, that there are gems that are going to be placed on there for the good works and the good deeds and the people that come to know the Lord and Savior as a result of your evangelism and your sharing of the gospel. But guess what? Here on earth, we want those rewards for ourselves typically. Here, we're going to be compelled to cast those crowns at the feet of the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the one who is worthy and he is the focus of this book. What are the creatures doing? Revelations 4, 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You know, when we gather together in corporate worship on Sunday mornings, we're getting a glimpse of what's going on in the heavenly places. Man, bask in that. Don't miss those opportunities. Spend time allowing God to work in your heart and mind and worship him in those moments. I was talking to a dear brother that I love that hasn't gone back to any church since COVID. He's still nervous about it. And maybe some of you are online and nervous about it as well. And I get that and I understand. But I had to say to him, you know what? I I trust my God in my life. And I believe so wholeheartedly in the fellowship of the saints and being together with believers and, and worshiping God with other people corporately and what it does for my soul. Way more. I believe in all that way more than I fear COVID. Come on, Jesus. I just got to believe that God is in control and there's something special and something sacred when we gather together as believers in Jesus Christ. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power for you are created, um, you created all things, going back to Genesis 1, and by your will they existed and were created. Then in chapter 5, we're reaching a defining moment for all humanity. The age of grace is about to end and the judgment of God is about to occur. So God reminded me again of a moment, and we're going to read about it here in a second. I was probably 24 years old and I was sitting in Cornerstone Church. And there was this preacher that was about 80 years old and his name was Derek Prince at the time. And what a blessing it was for me now to to understand that I got to catch one of his last sermons before he went on to be with the Lord. And there's a great gap and chasm for those of you who are young. When you're in your 20s, you think life goes on forever. Everything's going to be good. And you're, you're, you're starting to develop these memories. But as you get older, you start to cherish certain things. And when he was on stage, he's preaching from this next section of scripture. And it became something that I never forgot. At the moment, I didn't think it was all that important. But he gets to the scripture and he says, who is worthy to open up the seals? And nobody's worthy to open up the seals. And he begins weeping on stage. I'm like, what is wrong with this guy at that moment? But he had such an intimate relationship with Jesus that, man, he grasped this scripture in a way that I certainly couldn't at that particular time of my life, but I never forgot about it. And every time I read this next set of scriptures, I always remember Derek Prince preaching it and the importance it was to him. And then something inside of me saying, man, I want that kind of a relationship with my God. I don't have that intimacy level that Derek has in his life right now. How did, what's he seeing in this scripture that I'm not grasping? And maybe for some of you, this will be a moment you remember for the rest of your life as well. He says, then I saw at the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within it and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open up the, the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven on earth or under the earth was able to open up the scroll and look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. 
Think about that for a moment, the sacred scroll and the very hands of God. Who is worthy to open it up? And we look at our Bibles and we say, oh man, go go back to Moses. And of course Moses should be able to open it up. Look at all the great things that Moses did on earth. So this angel's going around, hey Moses, can you come open it up? And Moses like, nah man, you remember that time that I was like drunk and they had to come cover me up because I was naked? And they say, oh, surely David, David, man, he was the king of Israel. Surely David could open it up. And the angel goes up to David, David, man, can you open it up? And he's like, there was this incident with Bathsheba and her husband, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, God covered it up, but, you know, we can't go there. It says he went under the earth. I think the, uh, the angel just had to go in there. Oh, ain't nothing to see here. And he just popped out and he went on. It says he even searched the earth. Is there anybody alive right now? Are you worthy to open up the seal? And John began to weep, I think, because maybe, maybe, just maybe, he remembered Jesus on that cross that day. He remembered the one who he loved. Remember, John was the beloved one. He said, man, I remember when Jesus died. I remember how his blood was shed that we might have life. And he just says, fear not. For there is one who is worthy. There is one who is worthy. It says, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Saying the lion now. John had never seen that side of Jesus. He knew Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's about to see a different side of the one he loved. He saw Jesus, the one who, when Peter cut the guy's ear off, he comes up and puts his ear back on. But now he's going to see a different side, the judgment side of Jesus. He has conquered so he can open up the scroll and its seven seals. So these seals are progressively open. The scroll is beginning to open and it says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is worthy to save deliver, heal, set free, forgive, but he is also in the same vein a righteous judge who must judge. We're used to this season of grace where we could get away with things. We could cover them over and everything seems all right because we didn't get struck dead instantly, right? But there's this time coming on the earth that I pray creates an urgency in our hearts to share with those we love what is going to come in this future day where God is going to end this season of grace and he's going to come and he's, begin, he's going to begin to judge the world on its sin. And that's what we're about to read right now. I'll read the rest of the chapter to the end. Revelations 5, 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits God sent out all over the earth and he went and he took the scroll in the right hand of him who was seated before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth guess what one day we will reign on the earth Then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands upon thousands. Sometimes it looks like evil is winning out, but let me assure you, there are thousands and thousands and myriads who are worshiping our God, all saying together with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Maybe we should say that, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and ever. And to the four living creatures he said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Yes, there's some 
crazy tragedies that happen in this book. There's moments of elation. There's moments of great trepidation. But the focus of the book of Revelation is the lamb that was slain to take away the sins of the world. We're going to read a little bit about judgments. It's important that we do, but remember to keep them in context. Even in so judging, God's desire is that we would repent and turn from our sins and turn to him. He is the one who is worthy, who sacrificed all that we might have life with him and eternity. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When you read it in that context, it's pretty mild. But you know what the penalty of sin is? death. The penalty for sin is death. If you read through the first seven chapters of the book of Romans, you hear all the things that humanity does and it seems like a pretty hopeless state until you get to chapter eight. Thank God for chapter eight of the book of Romans when it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We are all lawbreakers who should be sentenced to death. But our criteria for acquittal, have you received the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior? See, in this church age, grace abounds, but it does not last forever. Revelation 6, 1. We're going to read about the seals being opened, and some people call this the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It opens up with some very tragic times for those who are here on earth. And I'm not about to debate whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or you believe it's going to all pan out in the end. I don't really care what you think about those particular issues. They're important. There is something theological, and God has one meaning in those things. But, you know, if you're pre-trib, you're out of here before this happens. Um, if you are post-trib, I believe God will help you and sustain you by the power of his Holy Spirit to get you through this season. Um, I, I truly believe that with all of my heart. And uh, God, God will work it out with either one of those. Those are not things worth dividing ourselves over or uh, debating endlessly as some choose to do. Revelation 6.1. No, I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come, and I looked and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. Most theologians believe this is none other than Antichrist being released to do his bidding on earth. You'll notice at first it says that he comes with a bow with no arrows. He comes as a man of peace. He says, everything's going to be all right. I'm the man of peace. He's maybe helped sign this peace accord that's going to happen, right? And then all of a sudden, a little bit later, you're going to see he shifts, and he's no longer truly this man of peace, but he's a man of death. He's the Antichrist. He's there to kill, steal, and destroy. Revelation 6, 3, he opens the second seal, and he heard the second living creature say, come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take the peace from the earth so that the people would slay one another and was given a great sword. Wars. Think about it right now. The Holy Spirit is a restraining force on the earth for good, and we still see all kinds of evil. At this particular moment, the Holy Spirit is removed from earth, and all kinds of evil just lives every which way that they want to. You don't want to be here during this time. Can I get an amen? No peace, only fear. Revelation 6, 5, then he opened the third seal and I heard the living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse, its rider had a pair of scales in its hand. And I heard to see what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil or the wine. Monetary collapse, hyperinflation, a day's wages for a loaf of bread. We would have never thought of these things even being possible in our own generation, Right? But look at what's happening right now. These are all setups to begin to condition our heart and prepare us for what is to come. It's no shocking thing that gas has gone from like a dollar a gallon up to five dollars a gallon or whatever the heck it is right now. You go to the grocery store and your bill gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, inflation is insidious. It's of the devil. Let me tell you something. It's a hidden tax. It hurts all of us. And man, all the more need for, you know, these baskets, I guarantee you are going to cost more to fill than they did last year. 
right? These are all setups. You see even that like later next week we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. Why do you think they want you to take a vaccine? Whether you believe in the vaccine or not, I'm not getting into the debating though, but the, the political aspects of it, of forcing people to get it. It's a setup so that later when it comes time for the mark, then they're going to be saying, oh, people are already conditioned. They already told us we got the vax back then. Okay, then all of a sudden you got to go get it. You know, th these are all setups that are occurring, one after another, after another, after another. Can you see them? They're taking place. The birth pains are right there before our very eyes to see. This isn't the tribulation or great tribulation that we find ourselves in, and it's already starting to get bad. Can you imagine what it's like for those living in this particular day? Revelation 6, 7, when I opened the four seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come, and I looked, behold, a pale horse and its rider was death, and Hades followed them, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword and with famine and with pestilence by wild beasts of the earth. A fourth of all the earth. What is there, eight billion people on the planet? You're talking about two million people dying in one fail swoop? by various things, killed with a sword, killed by famine, not having food that they need so that they could eat, killed by pestilence, what's pestilence? COVID-19, by disease, things of that nature are killing them at the same time, and by wild beasts of the earth. Your dog's gonna turn on you. Cats are already of the devil. Your cat will be like biting you. I mean like. Don't let that be the only thing that you remember of this message. <laughs> Revelation 6, 9. Then he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had come. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge the blood of those who dwell on the earth? Then they were given each a white robe and told to rest just a little bit longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were killed as they themselves had been. People will be killed for claiming the name of Jesus. Think about that. We take our Christianity for granted here in America. And maybe it's a bad thing. We've adopted a cultural Christianity and we've forgotten that we're at war. Don't forget where we're at. Don't let the devil lull you to sleep. The time's not too far off in the distant future where they're going to be coming for us. But they're crying out for judgment. You notice every other one is like a seal that's opened and you're seeing something manifest itself on the earth, but here the seal's open. And you're actually seeing the martyrs, those who have died for claiming the name of Jesus Christ, crying out for judgment. I don't know if it's just the martyrs who died during this tribulation period or maybe the martyrs who have died all throughout all of history. Coming back and saying, God, when are you going to avenge us? When are you going to go and, and bring judgment upon the earth? Revelation 6, 2, when I opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. The fig sheds its winter fruit when it's shaken by a gate. The sky vanished like a scroll that has been rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone slave and free hid themselves in caves and among the rocks and the mountains, calling the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand? All this calamity coming on the earth and then it's it just an increased calamity from every single angle and yet people are saying let the rocks fall on me. They're not saying I repent. They're not saying I turn from my sins. Lord, would you relent in your judgment? No, they go on sinning as most do in our own generation, right? They don't want to hear, they don't want to change, but would the Lord change their hearts? It's insane. Rather than turning to God who could save them, they hide their face from the living God. Chapter 7, the attention shifts back to, to heaven. In verse 2, And I saw an angel ascend from the rising of the sun 
with the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Next week, we're going to see how the devil goes and he counterfeits everything that God does. So the believers have a seal on their forehead. So what does he have to do? He has to get them to get a seal on their forehead or on the right hand so that they can be called his believers. The rest of the chapter talks about the 144 sealed Jewish believers who will be witnessing during the time of the Great Tribulation along with a heavenly scene where multitudes of believers are worshiping God with special attention paid to those who are martyred during the tribulation. Our last set of verses for today. God unleashes the seventh and final seal. Revelation 8, 1. The lamb opens the seventh seal. And there was silence in heaven. No worship any longer, just silence. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before the God and seven trumpets were given to them and another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer he was given much incense to offer the prayers for all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, and he throws the prayers onto the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumbling flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Those prayers for deliverance, those prayers for freedom, those prayers against injustice— God renders justice upon the evil that is on the earth. So what's the moral of the story here? Our time is short. Man, would we live for Jesus. Would we prioritize our lives around telling other people about the lamb who was slain before he turns into the lion of the tribe of Judah? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Jesus, you are the focus of this book. Let us never forget it. From Genesis to Revelation, a love story about a God who would send his one and only begotten son to die a sinner's death on the cross, that we might have life, that we might be reunited with you, Father, that we would be part of that great choir of angels, that great chorus in the heavens that shouting your glory and your praise father i pray right now for those in this room who don't know you lord having heard what is to come would it touch their hearts would it compel them by your great love to surrender their life to you i pray for anybody in this room who's just playing church right now that, Father, today would be the day that you open their eyes to this battle that really surrounds us in our generation and all throughout history and into eternity. Lord, I pray for those who are in the midst of a struggle right now. Father, would you come as the Prince of Peace? Father, I pray we would have an urgency in our evangelism, knowing that the church age is coming to an end, that we find ourselves in the very last chapters of this season of grace, and that one day judgment may come. But more importantly, and maybe most importantly, this could be the very last sermon you ever hear. It literally could. We've been talking a lot about the future, but none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. If your life is not right with Jesus, I encourage you right here, right now with nobody looking, but you know that today's the day you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to the Lord. I would love to pray for you right now. If that is you, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up real high right where you're at and I'll pray for you. Is there anybody here today that needs to surrender or resurrender their life to Jesus? I see your hand over there. Hallelujah, Jesus, and yours here and yours in the center, and yours over here on the right-hand side. Thank you, Lord, and yours, and yours, and yours. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for those who raise their hand. And Father, by way of rededication for the rest of us, we just truly proclaim that Jesus, you are the son of the living God. You were born of a virgin. You lived a sinless, spotless life here on earth. 
You willingly took yourself to the cross and died a sinner's death. You are the Lamb of God that was slain for our sins. Today we say we believe. We declare you as king of our lives. We surrender every aspect of who we are, the good, the bad, everything we lay at your feet today. And we say we love you, Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness that is promised in your name. We thank you for covering us by your blood that we don't have to face the coming judgments that are going to be coming upon the earth. And that, Father, our place in heaven is assured in you. We declare from that this moment forward we will live our lives for you and you alone. You are our God. You are our King. You are the only one who is worthy. And, Lord, we will serve you for all our days and into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Man, God bless you guys. If you made that declaration... I want to encourage you to let us know. We'd love to get you some information in your hands. You could text 